this is uh, lecture six. Uh, somehow, during the actual lecture, I lost the recording and the recorded file. So I'm doing an abridged version of it uh, in my office just to uh, provide uh, backup and continuity to the recorded lectures. So essentially what we did uh, in the previous lecture five uh, was to look at the use of uh, f -sol for solving a system of uh, nonlinear algebraic equations, an example being the separation process. And we saw basically how the nature of the problem changes. We change the specification from a linear one to a nonlinear one. <coughs> and uh, we saw the flow through of the control from function to function, from workspace to function, etc. These are the MATLAB aspects that you should be uh, comfortable with. Uh, also, we reviewed the basic idea of a local variable versus global variable and a function versus a script file. And we will continue to use these and introduce these concepts as we go along. Uh, I did assign a series of reading exercises. These are additional problems uh, from chapter one of the book that uh, you should be familiar with. So, what we did in the last lecture was to develop the energy balance equation for a lumped dynamic model. So we had a crucible in which we put a molten metal and the molten metal temperature is T1 and it is losing heat from the molten metal to the crucible according to this expression. And mass and CP of the uh, molten metal are also parameters that appear in this model. So in, in this equation there are essentially two unknowns, I should point out, T1 and T2, and they appear on the derivative as well as on the right hand side. So we call these equations coupled equations because T1 is affected by what happens to T1 and T2 on the right hand side. Similarly, T2 is also affected by what happens to T1 and T2 on the right hand side. And the other parameters are all known numbers like M1, CP1, M2, CP2, H1, A1, H2A2 are all numbers and quantity numbers that are given to us in a particular problem. We saw in the previous lecture how we can put this in a vector matrix form where I define a vector theta consisting of the unknowns T1 and T2. It's a vector, two, two by one vector. And the matrix A is a matrix of known constants. It's a two by two matrix of constants and that gets multiplied by theta. So if you do the actual vector matrix multiplication on the right hand side, you should get the right hand side of these two equations, 123 and 124. And similarly, B is a vector of known numbers. Once again, this is a number that we can calculate it provided we are given H1, H2, M2, CP2, T infinity, etc. I will show you the program where I actually implement this. But this is just a compact way of writing the same set of two equations. And once you do that, you will be able to then go into MATLAB and program these uh, functions for evaluation. Now, this is called a dynamic model because we have time appearing in here rate of change of temperature with respect to time. So that means at time t equal to zero, we must know what are the initial conditions. Okay, so the molten metal may be at 200 degrees and the ambient temperature may be 25 degrees. And we should know that, that uh, what the initial temperatures are. Then what we are interested in is plotting on a time axis the variation of t1 as a function of time. So this is what we mean, a curve like this that should satisfy this differential equation, ordinary differential equation, should satisfy the initial condition as well. So the Ti, this value should be corresponding to Ti for T1. And similarly, you will have a second graph that plots T2 uh, as a function of time as well. Now T2 might rise initially and then decay. Okay, so these are the two curves that we are interested in finding as a solution to this problem. Now one of the questions is what is the steady state? Now when there is a steady state that means things don't change with time. This might happen over a very long time. The love curves flatten out. In which case the theta which contains t1 and t2 do not change with time. So under steady state we set this equal to zero. And then we are left with a theta plus b is equal to zero. So from this we can solve for theta as equal to minus a inverse b. 
as a vector matrix product. Okay, you will see how to assemble these matrices and then how to get the steady state solution as well as how to get the dynamic solution. <coughs> now, the first thing that we need to do is prepare our problem for MATLAB. That means we need to tell MATLAB what are the two functions, what are the two equations that we are solving. These are the right hand side of these two equations, this expression. Okay, so when you take that expression and evaluate it in MATLAB, you will get a vector which would be a 2 by 1 vector. And the program that does this is given in the listing, but let's just go into MATLAB and see uh, how we can open that up. So here is a function, and this function takes t, the lowercase t is the time in the model, so time is an independent variable. And then uppercase t is the vector containing t1 and t2. Okay, it's going to be a vector of length 2. And how do we know that? We know that when we call that, we're going to pass two numbers. Now inside, as I said, h1, uh, h2 are all numbers, so they are initialized here, and the units are also given. And a1 is the area, a2 is the other area, t infinity is the ambient temperature, m1 cp1, m2 cp2. So all these from line 8 to 16 are just constants that appear in the model. Once we have these constants, we can actually define what A is because we know uh, that we have assembled how that function looks like. Let me just uh, go back and show you that function. So here it is. Okay, H1A1 over M1CP1, H1A1 over M1CP1 one with a minus, the other one with a plus. And that's exactly what we have here, minus H1A1 over MMCP1, space, and then H1A1 over MMCP1. That is the first row. Then you go to the second row, H1 over one over M2CP2, with a plus sign. And that's what you see here, H1A1 over M2CP2, okay? And space, and then the next expression that appears here, minus H1A1 plus H2A2 over M2CP2. So minus is a common factor, H1A1 plus H2A2 divided by M2CP2. So there's really nothing magical about it. All we have done is we have taken the original problem, put it in matrix form, and we are evaluating the 2 by 2 matrix here. The same thing for B, 0 and H2A2 T infinity over M2CP2. 0, H2A2 T infinity over M2CP2. So if you keep the labeling of these variables, in similar form, then it makes easy easier for you to just copy the function. Except you cannot use subscripts in here, um, so you use either arrays, or you can just use variables like h1, h2, a1, a2, etc. So the last step is f equals a t plus b. That's basically this term, a theta plus b. Okay, and once you do that, f is going to contain two elements in an array. Okay, and that is your function. Now. How do we use this function? How do we know that this function works? And this remember, this function takes a time and then two values for temperature. Let's just go to this uh, workspace and let's say heat 0, comma, uh, 200, comma, 25. Okay. So I'm saying that the first, the comma separates the input parameters. The first parameter for time is 0, that is the initial time. And this is the temperature, 225 are the temperatures. And of course, it gives me an error because I expect a column vector, not a row vector, inside the function. So if I transpose this, I get minus 87.5 and then 875. So this tells me that the first function, which is a function for p theta 1 dt, so that that is negative, that means t1 is going to decrease. Okay. The second number is positive but very large, which is a derivative for dt2 with respect to time. That says that the t2 temperature is going to increase, and not only increase, but increase at a very rapid rate, whereas this will decrease at a much slower rate. What actually MATLAB does is it takes this information about the rate of change of the derivatives. These are the functions calculated from the right hand side. Turns out that they are also the rate of change of time with respect to temperature with respect to time. So it uses that to calculate what would be, to predict what would be the temperature at the next instant of time by taking a very small step. And the algorithm that it uses, we will see later on in the course. <coughs> so what we know so far is we have written a function called heat, and that function works. And if you give it at any time, it tells what are the slope. For example, I could do, for example, at one second, the temperature might be, I don't know, might be 
170 degrees and this might be 55 degrees for example so I can say what is the rate of change at that time and then I can project what would be the temperature at the next time now the ODE function makes use of this function that we have written to construct the curves construct the solutions for us over a range of time okay so how does ODE work let's just ask for help ODE 405 that's the name of the function and um, yeah, of course you can ask how would I know that if you don't know that you can go to this function browser and click on that and then type ODE for example so it will tell you all the ODE functions that are available uh, in MATLAB that are related to solving ordinary differential equations you can pick any one of them and try to explore more but in our case I know that I want to use ODE 4.5 so I can ask for help ODE 4.5 and it prints out a lot of information but what you need to worry about is what are the inputs that ODE 4.5 requires and what are the outputs that it is going to produce okay you need to understand that so ODE 4.5 is a built-in function and it first thing that it requires is the name of the function that you have written in our case it is the heat function named heat because that is the one problem that we want to solve the next parameter is called T span which tells you over what range of time you want to integrate from 0 to 10 seconds, 0 to 100 seconds, whatever it is that you decide, you need to specify that T span. And then the next one is the initial condition. Okay, So in fact these are the information that we know from the problem, the initial condition and the function itself, the equation, and over what range we want to integrate that time. These are the three basic information that it needs. There are a lot of other options that we'll not worry about them at this moment. And what it sends out, OD45 sends out, is the time, a vector containing time at which it has calculated the solution and an output. This will be T1 and T2 as a function of time. Let's see how we actually use this. Uh, I have written a driver program, a script that will actually implement this. So let's open that up. So here is a script. The first line, the script, the executable line is line 3, and I'm just clearing the workspace of everything. And then I'm defining I'm defining a figure one. So I'm going to capture my first plot in figure one. And here I have T span. T span is the range. I'm start, I want to start from actually it should have been zero. Zero in steps of 0.1 to 100. I want to go up to 100 seconds. You might ask, how do I know that the units are seconds? You know that by simply looking at the units that I've given here. For example, H1 is watts. Watts is joules per second. Okay, so that gives me the hint that everything in this problem is going to be in terms of seconds, up to 100 seconds. T0 is the initial condition, 225. And the way that I use to solve this is simply ODE45, open parenthesis, this is the name of the function. The function name must always be preceded by this ampersand sign, and then the name of the function itself, comma, and then the next parameter, which is T span, which says integrate from 0 to 100 seconds. The third one is my initial condition. That's all you need to do. And it returns T and lowercase t in which it has time and uppercase t in which it has T1 and T2. Now I have put this in the form of a script file, but within the script file there is this idea of a cell. That is, you can create sub-cells and you can execute only those part of the cells. The way to create a cell is to put two percent signs followed by a space and then whatever you want to type as a title. And then it immediately takes that as a cell. For example, if I want to put a cell at the end of this, all I need to do is, and then it becomes line 6 to 8 becomes a single cell, and 2 to 5 becomes a single cell. There's no reason for me to break it up. I'm just showing how to create a cell. So let me get rid of it. So the first cell actually sets up everything and gives me the solution. So if you want to execute only that cell, that is the contents of that particular section, you can go to this line and then say evaluate the cell and it creates but it doesn't plot it. And if you go to the workspace you will find in the workspace there is a vector called t and that contains thousand values of time in steps of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 all the way up to 100. Okay? At each one of those time values, these are time values, at each one of those time values I have two vectors those are given as a matrix. So the first one is the temperature starting from 200 it is going down. The second one is the temperature T2 which is starting at 25. As you can see it rises very rapidly to 76 in one step. Uh, that is 0.1 seconds. Each one is 0.1 seconds apart. 
So in the Paris, the first temperature decreased only by about 8 degrees, the second one almost more than double. And now these are arrays, but I can plot them and visualize what the uh, profile looks like. Okay, so I go to the next cell, the next cell I'm actually plotting them. So I can evaluate that cell and that will give me the plot. So this is the temperature of T1 that starts from 200 and decreases very rapidly and this one increases up to about 90 degrees and then starts decreasing. It is a crucible that gets heated and then it continues to lose heat to the surrounding and it loses. So I don't have to go to 100 because it has reached steady state by about 20. So I can go back and say instead of doing 100, do it only up to 20. Okay, and then save that and re-execute that line and then go to the next one and re-execute that sound. So that gives you uh, a better, better graph of the same thing. So this is called a time series where you're plotting T1 and T2, the temperature T1 and T2 against time. So it's called a time series. You can also plot temperature 1 against temperature 2 and that's called a state space plot and that's what is done in the next cell. So if I say plot a second graph, it shows me on the x-axis T1, on the y-axis T2. So remember, when initially this curve is parameterized with the time. So at time equal to zero, we had T1 at 200 degrees and uh, T2 at 25 degrees. And then T1 decreases continuously, whereas T2 increases and then decreases. And they both end up with 25 degrees. And this is a trajectory of how the temperature changes uh, with respect to time as a parameter. And each graph is useful in uh, certain types of interpretations. So that's the basic problem that we wanted to solve. How to set up that particular set of two differential equations and solve it using ODE45, the basic problem. Okay. Um, let's go back and see what else can we look at. For example, we want to look at the steady state. How do I get the steady state? Well, I, I can go to this function and I have calculated A and B. So at steady state, I know that um, the function is zero, d, of d theta d t is equal to zero. Okay, So I can make a copy of this function, save as, uh, for example, steady state. Okay, And uh, I guess I already have that, let me close that and then try to save it again. Save as uh, steady state. Okay, the reason I wanted to do that is to show you how to take this function and change it to get the steady state solution. Now for steady state solution, we don't need a function because this function is not going to be called repeatedly. Okay, so I can get rid of that and make it into a script file. And so I get rid of this. And once I have calculated all these, I can say the solution x solution is equal to minus a backslash b. That's all I need to do. The same problem, but I'm getting only the steady state solution. I've computed A and I've computed B, and I'm going to get the solution. So I save this and then I run this. Okay, when I run that, I should be able to get the value of X solution, and you can see that both are 25 degrees. Of course, as it cools to the ambient temperature, both should go to 25 degrees. So this tells me that I have set up all the parameters right, I've calculated the matrices right. So it's a way of kind of checking that uh, uh, the problem has been set up correctly in uh, MATLAB. Okay. And uh, the next part that we wanted to look at is uh, discuss the effect of uh, property variations on the result. And I think we discussed this in the class, so let me just go over them. Uh, what happens if H2 is decreased? Now, the type of questions that as a process engineer one might ask is, in this particular case, I notice that it uh, uh, decreases um, to 25 degrees over a very short time. So let me just replot that. So it, it goes over 18, 20 seconds, it goes down. Suppose I want to keep it hot for a longer period of time for some reasons like heat treatment. What can I do to slow down the cooling rate? This curve, I want to slow down this curve. There are a number of things that one can do if you understand the physical description of the problem. So if you go back to the problem and say, how can I 
slow it down. I can, for example, decrease H2. H2 refers to the heat loss from the crucible to the surrounding. Or I can increase the infinity. Okay, that is, I can program the temperature cooling by putting it in a furnace and then uh, gradually decrease the ambient temperature. Let me just show you first uh, how we would do the uh, cooling, uh, changing the heat transfer coefficient. Okay, so I'm going to now explore, construct a series of solutions where I'm exploring changing the parameter H2. Okay, um, how am I going to do that? I'm going to add one more cell. Explore the effect of lowering, oops, effect of lowering H2. Okay, Th that's our goal. So I'm going to use a similar function that I have already written, but I'm going to change the values of H2 in a systematic manner. Okay, how can I do that? I can open that function again. Okay, there it is. And I'm going to have to change the value of the function H2 inside. It's no longer a constant. Okay, so I need to have a way of passing that various values of H2 inside. So the first thing is I comment this line or I delete that line so that I don't have H2 in there. And then I say global H2. So this is a new feature that you're going to learn. So the value of H2 is actually passed from the workspace as a global variable into this function. Okay, and so in the main script, this is a function that's going to be called by ODE four or five many many times, and each time I want to solve this with a different value of h two. Okay, now I go to the original function, and I copy this section so that I don't have to retype the whole thing. So my span is the same. I may want to increase the span back to fifty integrate from 0 to 50 for example. But here I'm going to declare global h2. Global, global h2. Okay, I'm uh, declaring the variable h2 and then I'm going to control the value of h2 from here. So I'm going to create another variable called h2 list as equal to uh, 1, 0. Point 7, 0 0.3, 0 0.1, for example, four different values of h that I want to explore. So I'm just creating a list. And then I set a loop. Um, and this loop has to repeat the calculation many, many times. So I'm going to put the loop here for i equals 1, colon. My keyboard is not working. Colon. Oops. One colon. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> I don't know what the problem is with my keyboard. It's a wireless keyboard. Colon. Okay. One colon uh, length of H2 list. What this does is sets up a loop for as many entries as there are in the variable h2 list. So the length of h2 list is going to be 4 in this case because there are 4 numbers in there. So it's going to go to 1 to 4. The reason I do it like this is I can easily come back and add another variable, for example, 0 0.05. Okay, then it will automatically do it for 5 uh, number variables. Okay. And uh, t span is going to be the same in all the cases, and t0 is going to be the same for all the cases, but h2 is going to be equal to uh, from that value h2 list I want to pick that particular number. Okay, So when i equal to 1 I want to pick the first number. When i equal to 2 in this loop I'm going to pick the second number etc and store it in h2 and then it will be passed through the global variable to the heat function when I call it. Okay, And 
then we have this integration and once I come out of this for example I want to plot t comma t okay and here uh, I may want to make each plot in a different color okay so if I want to do that I need to specify the next parameter as the color so let me create a variable called color i okay but I need to define this like if I am whenever I'm using a variable I should define this before so I'm going to define the color as equal to it's a character string so red blue green cyan um, magenta or something like this now how, how do I know which characters work you can go to help plot and it will tell you what are the colors that are allowed B G R C M for example okay B G R C M let me just use in the same order B G R C M okay so I have five entries there and so I have five different colors and these are character variables so I put them in quotation mark okay and then it's going to plot that particular um, solution for each value of h and that's all I need I think so let me just say end it and try to run it and see what happens okay so I did not put for example a semicolon so it prints that out and let's see what I have in the figure the figure I have only the last one the magenta one that came out okay what and let's see why because I need the whole otherwise the plot will just keep on plotting one on top of the other so let me create a figure figure 3 which will open a new window and then say uh, hold on okay so that's going to keep the plots uh, on top of each other let's try it again uh, once again I get only one value now I need to debug why, what is happening here okay so let me set up a breakpoint and then execute that uh, I guess let me execute from there okay so this is the figure 2 figure 1 etc it has stopped execution right from the beginning of the program to this line so let me just step one at a time okay so I've created h2 list I opened the figure 3 and t span and for i equal to 1 okay so i is now 1 and I'm picking the h2 value as the first value which is 1 that's correct and then I get the solution for t and capital T okay and then I plot that so there is my plot and then I go back this time i must be equal to 2 and so h2 must be 0.7 h2 is 0.7 and uh, perhaps I didn't save this file after I changed it. that's why it's not picking that okay all right and then continue so now you see the second with uh, green okay that is for value of 0.7 so as you decrease the heat transfer coefficient it takes longer for it to cool okay you can see and now you can continue this and get one more graph in red so it takes even longer when h is 0.3 and when h is 0.1 it takes even longer 50 seconds is still not reached and then when it is 0.05 it takes even longer so that's how you can do parametric studies and the basic idea that we have learned here is how to use a global variable to pass the value from the main script that you see here to a function which ODE 4.5 will call repeatedly like as you see here calls heat but every time it goes into the heat it's going to pick up a value of h2 that you set outside the program and passing it through the idea of a global variable I think that's how much we saw in the last lecture so let me stop there and then we will pick up uh, uh, in the next lecture from here